Now, if you were to ask me, John, what gives you the greatest security in your life? I will let you know that it is not my wife. I love her. She loves me. And we're in a secure relationship, praise God. But she's not my security. And it's not my family. I got two great kids and two grandkids, and I love them and care for them, and they for me, but that's not what provides me the security. Uh, I have a bank account. I have a few TFSAs and a couple of RSPs, but that ain't what gives me any security. I don't know about you. If any of you have been watching your investments over the last year, uh, it's not good. And uh, I'm probably 10 years <laughs> further behind than I was uh, before COVID hit. What I would say, it's not even my profession. That doesn't really give me security. I love God and honor God and thank, for the, thank him for the calling and the placement of his spirit on me, but that's not what gives me security. What gives me security is the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. Now, when we hear the word sovereignty or sovereign, that's not a word that we hear often, is it, in our world today. Um, sovereignty is a political term um, that refers to a dominant power or a supreme authority. So in the monarchy, for instance, uh, supreme power resides with the monarch, right? Who at this point in time in the British uh, Empire of things is the king. The king is sovereign. So in other words, the one who's in charge that's what sovereignty means. And so when we talk about the sovereignty of God, what it simply means is that all things, all things, not just a few things, not just something, but everything that it has ever existed is under God's rule and under his control, and nothing, absolutely nothing, happens in his kingdom without his knowledge and awareness of what's going on. Guess what? He doesn't even ask you for advice on what he should do. Praise God for that. Nothing tapes him by surprise. He, he doesn't wake up one morning, come downstairs and grab a coffee and open his phone to get the latest news feed and go, what? Another, another war broke out? What? Another movie star is dead? What? what? The, 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 uh, T, uh, the TXA and uh, all those other financial things have taken a mass doesn't take him by surprise. He doesn't say, oh, come on, how come somebody didn't wake me up earlier <laughs> to find out what's going on? No. Think about it. Nothing, absolutely nothing gets past him. Nothing gets past him. He's present. Think about this. There's 24 time zones in this world. Uh, and he doesn't bebop. <laughs> oh, I'm in this. Now I've got to go over here and get into this time zone and get over here. And then there's 8 billion people on the face of the earth, and he doesn't go running to and fro, okay, uh, I've got this person to take care of, and then I'm going to run somewhere else and take care of somebody else, and uh, like 8 billion. And then he's got all other kinds of kingdom stuff and universe stuff that he's managing, like spinning the world on its axis, which he does daily, thank you, Father, um, and lets that yellow thing in the sky break through most times uh, in our day. God never falls asleep at the wheel, going back and forth, as it were, every day without understanding what's going on. You see, God knows everything. He knows absolutely everything. And his sovereignty means that he is anchored in everything, and the awareness that God is aware of everything in this world anchors my soul. I can breathe. I can go... Thank God there is somebody in charge. It gives me calmness, really, in the midst of my chaos. I'm less perturbed about all the calamities of life or harsh realities revealed on a daily basis in my life or that of the world. Why? Because I know that every situation that happens has taken place under his jurisdiction and with his watchful eye. He knows it. God knows it. 
God allows it. And it's likely that he is using whatever has come into your life today, whether you think it's, as we talked about last week, good or bad, um, whatever your perception of that is, God is using it to accomplish his purposes on earth. Personally, I'm more, dis- I'm more disturbed by difficult people than I am by difficult circumstances. And so the greatest security that you can have in life is to see and understand the sovereignty of God. Everything is going to be okay. When I have that awareness in my heart, even when we're going through life-sucking, life-depleting circumstances, we know that everything is going to be okay. How do I know that? If you take your Bibles, if you have them or you can open them, the ones that are in front of you, and turn to Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44, and we're going to read verses 6 to 8. But as we do that, I'm going to invite you to stand as we read and honor God in the reading of his word. Isaiah 44, verses 6 to 8. This is what the Lord, Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty, because there's a few descriptors there, right? (laughs) Because the writer couldn't find enough words to talk about this awesome person. What the Lord, Israel's king and redeemer, and the Lord Almighty says, I am the first and the last. There is no other God. Who else can tell you what's going to happen in the days ahead? Let them tell you if they can and thus prove their power. In other words, if, here's, a, here's a John Gray paraphrase. Okay, if there's anybody out there that thinks they're greater than me, bring it on. Bring it on. We'll see. Let them tell you if they can and thus prove their power. Let them do as I have done since ancient of times. If, they're, if they think they're greater than me, then they should be able to do all the things that I've done. Do not tremble, verse 8. Do not be afraid. Have I not proclaimed from ages past what my purposes are for you? You are my witnesses. Is there any other God? What's the answer? No. No. There's no other God. There is no other rock. No, not one. You may be seated. You see, God is telling us that he has no equal. There's nobody on the earth or in the heavens above or below or in the universe anywhere that is greater than him. Now, interesting, he says he's he's the beginning and the end in our text. If we're to go to the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 13, there it says this. Jesus says, I am the, Jesus, right? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. (laughs) And so Jesus here just declares who he is as God and the God of the universe and the creator of all that is. Now to be Alpha, to be the Alpha dog, Uh, To be the one who's in charge, to be the first, to be the beginning, means that everything started with him. He is before all things. So whenever, whenever the, and again, this blows our mind, before the universe even began, we know the earth began, and there's all kinds of understanding about, was that 5,000 years ago, or was it, a bazillion years doesn't really matter at the end of the day <laughs> at the end of the day because he's the one who made it and before the universe even existed there was God okay uh, that's pretty hard for us to get our mind bent around right it is for me for sure and it means that everything that ever existed started with him he's before all things and to be before all things mean that everything that has ever existed he was. So we think we're pretty smart people today, don't we? I think by and large, we have these amazing scientific breakthroughs. Ba-ba. Or we have new medical advances that never occurred before. Ba-ba. Right? Uh, we have pharmaceuticals that can do amazing things to bring healing to our bodies. And, and we think that the advancement of modern science is, is amazing. And it is amazing. But guess what? 
before all of that, there was God who put all of those things into the earth so that people could learn over time how to use those things to be able to create the things that they do. And uh, so even things like antibiotics, right, the which we think are the mainstay of our mainstay health of system in the last however many years it's been since that was made. Before all that, there was God. He's the one who gave those smart, intelligent people the capacity to actually do that. And so John the Apostle puts it this way, through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Amazing. Nothing comes before him. Nothing is subject. He's not subject to anything, or he's, nor is he under anything. Apart from me, the word says, there is no God. You see, God is the one and the only. No one above him. Nobody on par with him. He is supreme. He is the boss. He calls the shots. He is the authority. He called the stars by name. You didn't. Um, <laughs> he, and he put the stars up there in the first place. And he doesn't seek, as I said before, our permission, yours or mine, or consult with us what he should do. Um, he's God, and he's God alone. And so what on earth is the right response to understanding a sovereign God? The only response to a sovereign God is to worship him. That's all. What else can we do but worship? And when we fall in submission, literally on the knee, because we're recognizing I am nothing apart from his massive greatness and understanding. So, even Paul said this. He said, there will come a day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, sovereign, the one on the throne, the one who knows it all. That means that somewhere in, in the span of our existence, if we use today's numbers, eight billion people will bend the knee to Jesus. There will be a day. There will be a day. And so our only response to his sovereignty and his greatness is to worship. Anything less than doing that cannot be our object of worship or is it worthy of our worship because anything less means there's something greater and that greater one ought to be the one who is worshipped if you get that little tongue twister right anything less than him cannot be our object of worship what was Israel's problem what was our and what is our problem we tend to put other things ahead of God we tend to create other idols which we think kind of represent things of a God or a sense of power or control in our lives um, until AA reminds us that we are all powerless. We're all powerless. What an amazing proclamation. Because it's in the awareness of our powerlessness that the greater one actually begins to as ascend to his throne, God. We come to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. And that explains why we trust him and are willing to give our lives over to him. He's our God. There is no other. We've tried. Our gods don't work. But our living God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, there is no equal. He's greater than all the things that we could ever attempt to do to put in place of him. He has no competitor. Nothing comes even close to being a threat to his authority. And so we must actively seek God alone and push all the substitutes that so easily creep into our life and push them aside saying, no, I'm going to be running to God. I'm going to chase after his goodness. We talked about last week, I'm going to run after his goodness because his goodness will bring me into the presence of the sovereign. No God of any kind, whether it's seen, things that we can create with our hands or our stuff or our technology or things that are unseen, things like idols of the heart will do. 
But the problem is, though, we often displace God as sovereign when something else becomes more attractive or more important to us than God. Or when we seek something else to give us what only God can give. And so I want, I, I, there's a couple of questions to ponder this morning. First of all, think about this for a moment. Does God hold the same place in your heart that he holds in the universe? Does God hold the same place in your heart that he holds in the universe? If we, would rec- if we recognize that God is supreme and all-powerful and amazing and wonderful and all of the adjectives we could ever describe about his universal engagement with us, does he have that same place in our heart? Second question is this. Is there anything in your life that you haven't submitted to him? <laughs> I know me. Oh, I'll submit some things to God. Yeah, I'll, I'll give that over to you, God. Uh, but this little piece of me you can't have. Uh, no, I don't want to submit that to you. I'd rather hang on to that and try on my own. Thank you very much. What about your time? Have you submitted your time to God? Are you going, oh, no, God, I'll, I'll give you some time. I'll carve out Sunday morning at 1030 to gather with others, but uh, don't ask anything else of me. Um, oh, well, okay, maybe I'll come to fusion and stretch that out. Uh, but, oh, God, you're asking a lot of me. Like, holy cow. And then to be involved in ministry and, and to engage in, and ex- use my gifts? Uh, God, I'd rather be out on the river fishing. Um, God, I'd rather be up hiking in, or skiing. I, I can't imagine what Shames is like today. Um, I, mean, I don't even know if it's open, but uh, <laughs> I'm assuming it's open. Um, I'd rather be there. Uh, how about your relationships? Are you willing to submit your relationships to God? Your marriage? Your kids? Your grandkids? What about your future? Your health? Your money? Your sexuality? If we haven't submitted it to him, then those things are displacing him as Lord. It doesn't mean those things aren't important to us. It's just what degree are they holding and anchoring my heart for my security other than God? And so let's reaffirm and recognize him today and worship him as the one and only God. And so I I want us to make a declaration this morning that God is my Lord, right? Let's say it together. He is Lord, okay? He is Lord. Say it again. He is Lord. Say it again. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. If he is sovereign, then he must be Lord. He can't be anything other. God cannot be a subset on your priority list of your life. He's not simply one of the many parts of our life that you check off to make sure you've done every day, right? Uh, Yeah, I got out of bed. Check. Um, Yeah, I've had three meals a day. Yep, check. Yeah, I took my vitamins today. Yep, I went to work today. Yep, Um, I spent time with my family today. Yep, Uh, oh, I went to school uh, or ministry. Oh, Oh, yeah, God. Oh, my goodness. Um... Yeah, I didn't spend any time to, today with God. So, anyway, I'll do it tomorrow. Um, because, and so, God often becomes this subset on our list. And once in a while, he's on our list. But God doesn't want to be on your list. He doesn't want to be one of many parts of your life where you just fit him in where it's convenient. He is Lord of all. He's Lord of all. Every area of our life, our studies, our career, our family, our ministry, our sexuality, all of those things, we declare him as Lord. He is Lord. And when we submit those things to him, something transformative happens because heaven comes down. Oh, my goodness. Heaven won't come until we submit. If we don't submit, And we can't figure out, well, God, I prayed about this and done this, and how come nothing's working? I better go back and check my checklist again. Or maybe I need to pray harder. God doesn't want you to 
pray harder or read 10,000 verses today. <laughs> None of those things are bad in and of themselves, but you're, we're doing it for all the wrong motivation. We need to submit. God, God is not like an out-of-town friend who comes to visit you. We've all had them, right? Uh, and he doesn't come and stay, just to stay in your house. He, he's only there for a short time. And, and so God is a guest in your house. He's polite. He's easy to get along with. He stays in the guest room. He stays out of mischief. He doesn't use the, he doesn't use the kitchen too much. Um, he dare doesn't turn on the TV without asking. Um, and he will not walk into your bedroom uninvited. He's just a guest. Is he just a guest in your life? Is he just a guest in your home and in your heart? You see, we have to begin to change that perspective. Because in reality, God owns the house. God owns your body. God owns your mind and your heart and everything about you. He owns everything you possess. He can open up the fridge anytime he wants, right? He can take whatever he likes whenever he wants it. Because in fact, when we begin to understand that it all belongs to him, we now become his steward. We steward our life. We steward our heart. We steward our mind. And we give it to him because we declare that he is the owner. He's Lord. See, I think this is near to the picture of the Christian life. And the right response to a sovereign God is to surrender and to submit to his ownership and to his lordship. You see, God doesn't just control the things that are in front of us. The Bible says he, con he controls earthly kings and he presides over angels. Wow. He governs human events. Again, our puny minds can't figure out what on earth God is doing and why he allows certain things. But listen to several verses here of God's word that reminds us about who he is. The Bible, uh, Proverbs says, The heart of a man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. Wow. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but the purpose of the Lord that will stand. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. The Lord, remember this, the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation. God does amazing things with ungodly people. <laughs> For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose, John says in the book of Revelation. And then Paul says in Philippians, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. It is God who works in you, both to will and to do, for his good pleasure. And so we surrender to him, because we understand that he is more than qualified to be our Lord. He loves us, and he doesn't want anything to harm us or to hurt us or to bring us into discord and to bring us into, into uh, undue stress. Now, you may be here in this room this morning, and maybe you're not a follower of Jesus. You may be searching for meaning in your life. You're searching for spiritual connection, and, and life hasn't been going quite as you expected or hoped that it would. You need to humble yourself. Oh, yuck. Like, come on. Who really wants to humble themselves? That's not generally in our interest. We want to promote ourselves, do we not? But if we humble ourselves, we can now be connected to a power that is greater than ourselves. And to, but in order to do that, we have to release our pride. And we have to confess that we've missed the mark. We've sinned of trying to be our own God. And we need to accept Jesus Christ as the one who can restore us into a lasting and eternal friendship with God. 
for those of you who are followers of Jesus in this room this morning, it means that what you once thought as thought of as your time or your money or your talents or your career or your interests in reality are his. And we turn our lives over to him and to his care because we have been restored into a right relationship with God. And so when we're restored into a right relationship with God, then we release all of those things that can easily get in the way and distort our understanding of Jesus. Remember, this message series is entitled With Eyes Wide Open. And yet sometimes we think our eyes are wide open, but all this stuff filters through our, our lenses and we can't see God as he really is. And how do we begin to see him? As we release and as we humble ourselves and as we trust and as we obey. The third thing we need to see this morning is that God is in control. God is in full control. And the right response to a sovereign God is to trust him and obey him. And all that comes into my life is either allowed or decreed by a good God who will use it for my benefit. Even though in the moment, I may not be able to see it. So when a loved one lies in a hospital bed, I may be rattled. But deep down, I must know that he is in full control. And when my finances are beginning to run low, I may be hard-pressed, but deep down, I must acknowledge that he is in control. Nothing will enter my life that bypasses God's interest for me. And nothing will ever enter my life that if I'm willing to trust him, he cannot work out for my good. Sometimes people get hit by a Mack truck <laughs> in life. And it's painful, and it's awful, and it's bad, perhaps on some level, not pleasant. But when you get hit by the Mack truck, you have the opportunity to believe that God will work it out for your good. See, it's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of who do I trust. Because anything apart from this in our life is our willful declaration that God is not sovereign. But he is. Nothing limits God. For the last couple of Sundays, I've quoted a guy named A.W. Tozer. And he says that God is the only absolute being or entity uh, who is free. He's, he's the only one who is actually free in this universe. And, and Tozer says this, He, God, must be free to do whatever he wills, to do, any, to do anywhere at any time to carry out his eternal purpose in every single detail without interference. Were he less than free, he must be less than sovereign. God is the only free being. And when we allow him the freedom to work in our life, then we can believe that God will work all things out together for good to those who love God, comma, and to those who are called according to his purpose. Right? The Bible doesn't say he's going to work everything out for your good. That's... <laughs> Uh, that's where sometimes as believers we don't get the full understanding of what he's saying. But he will work it out for his eternal purpose. And therefore, we must absolutely refuse to be worried about what's going on in our life. Oh, we need to pray intently, no doubt. You know, in life, when we get hit by a Mack truck, we need to pray. And we need to pray lots. And, and we need to pray for some measure of understanding and some sense of grace and mercy, but we need to refuse to worry because God is doing things that we don't understand, but we have to believe. And when we bow down to pray, are we really fully aware of who we're talking to? <laughs> are we really aware of who we're talking to? The one to whom we pray and the one whom hears our prayers has the power to rule over the entire universe he is able to rule over every single atom a-t-o-m and yet above all that he loves and he cares about you wow 
the one who just by his word brought creation into being, he's amazing. That's who we are talking to when we pray. And so how can we not worship him? How can we not? To do anything less then means that we're putting another God ahead of him. And so let's pray. And then we're going to worship. So surely come on forward. Almighty God, we thank you for this moment when we can pause and ponder <laughs> your greatness. And we're mindful of your sovereignty over all of creation and especially over us, your people, in this little secluded corner of your vast universe. We want to acknowledge you, and here at Terrace Alliance this morning, we acknowledge you as Lord. And we give you permission to run our lives and to be our guide. And so we also ask you to forgive us for the times that we have disregarded you and, and have played up our own importance and for the times that we have placed our focus on the wrong things. And so help us to remember your goodness and your grace. And dear Lord, we want, to, we want you to be the center of our lives, not just on the checklist of our life, but to be the core of who we are. And so we choose this day to honor you as Lord. And so help us move through these next moments together and then through the days of this week with that in mind. And so may your name be lifted up. May your glory shine through us. And uh, may you, as we worship you, uh, feel the joy in your heart as your created ones, your children, bless and honor you. Amen.